Good morning. Once again, it's always a blessing to uh, deliver, deliver the living oracles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to his congregation. We want to thank Brother Darius for a wonderful job of uh, reading the scriptures. It's, it's, it's always uplifting to see young people involved with the congregational work. As he read in your hearing this morning, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the mindset of Christ. This mindset was in the heavens before the creation. Ever since man went astray, the Lord has been working to recover man, not only his body, not only his soul, but his intellect, his emotions, and his will that they may come back in tune to his will. Eretheia, selfish ambition, is the word that we are talking about. Devoted or concerning only for one's self. Eretheia, selfish ambition. Concerned primarily with only one's interest. That frame of mind to where you are only interested in yourself. Only interested in how you can benefit your welfare, regardless of others. What selfish ambition is characterized by or manifesting concern or care only for one's self. Selfish ambition, selfish motive, canondoxia, vainglory or deceit, excessive vanity is what it is. It is an inordinate pride in one's self or one's personal achievement to do anything to get ahead. When we look at the words selfish ambition, vain glory or conceit makes me think about the politicians. Because they're going to do anything to win that election. Better get there. So our topic this morning is serving, having a servant's attitude with what we just went over. You cannot have a servant's attitude with selfish ambition and conceit and vain glory. You cannot have a servant's attitude with that. Okay. So, serving and having a servant's attitude, it's about serving, assisting, and sacrifice see when we do these things we we have to sacrifice some things you see so in what ways is serving others a key part of a christian's life in what ways serving others a key part in a christian's life everyone's a christian in here this morning when we look at the story of uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, 
We understand that Elkanah had two wives, one named Hannah and one named Penanah. Penanah had children, but Hannah could not have children because the Lord had not opened up her womb yet. So Penanah would provoke Hannah all the time concerning this issue. So this bothered Hannah. So she prayed to the Lord. And she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will lend him to you all the days of his life. So Elkanah would go up to, I think it was Shiloh or whatnot, every year to make his yearly sacrifices. And when they had returned from sacrifices, Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and she bore a son. And she named him Samuel. Now, Samuel was lent to the Lord. And when we look at chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, we get a chance to see Hannah's prayer. Hannah prayed to the Lord. She thanked the Lord. She exalted the Lord. She esteemed him highly. She loved the Lord for what the Lord had given her. She didn't only have one child, she had a, a few children. So we see that in chapter 2 and verse 11 that Elkanah went home from Ramah and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So she gave him to the Lord and he went into service as a boy so my first point is serving others is one way of serving god samuel was eli's helper or assistant in this role samuel's responsibility would have been including opening the tabernacle doors each morning cleaning the furniture and sweeping the floors he had duties to do see i'm sure eli trained him to do this and once the boy understood what he needed to do, Eli didn't have to, hey, get up, boy. Go open up the door, sweep the floor, wipe off everything. Unlike what we have to do with our kids every day. Hey, hey, boy, I ain't going to tell you no more. Get up, take out the garbage. Why can't our sons and daughters just be like Samuel? Just get up instead of sleeping until 10, 11 o'clock. <laughs> so, Samuel, we see this in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 6, 15. Samuel had a vision concerning the future of Eli. So, God came to Eli and uh, to Samuel and stood before him. He did it four times, but the third time when Samuel went and said to Eli, here I am, he called me. He said, no, next time you hear that voice, say, here I am, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. So he did it, and the Lord revealed to him the fate of Eli's lineage. So we see in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 15, Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. See, each morning he would get up, and he had a task to do. He had duties to do. So, as he grew older, Samuel would have assisted Eli in sacrificing. See, so he would have to assist him in offering sacrifices the fact that he was wearing a linen ephod a garment worn only by priests showed that he was a priest in training you see we have become priests and kings in the lord to where we offer up uh spiritual sacrifices that is with the fruit of our lips, you see. So, 
and we read this in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 18. Samuel was ministering uh, before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen apron. Because Samuel was Eli helper, he was God's helper too. You got to remember that when we are helping people, we are helping God too. Because God is spirit. God needs us to do the work for him. We have to work for him, you see. When you serve others, even in carrying out ordinary tasks, you are serving God. So don't ever think, I ain't, man, I ain't doing nothing for that cat. Let him get it on his own. That's the attitude of the world. You know, God expects for us to use wisdom when it comes to giving and helping and knowledge and understanding. That's what he wants us to use. If we know that somebody is spending their money up on crack and, uh, you know, going out wasting his money on harlots and spending all his wealth on booze, you come and ask me for some money, I'm going to use wisdom right there. So every job has dignity because ultimately the one we serve is God. That's who we serve, God. In Colossians chapter 3, and verse 23, like Paul told the Colossians, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And not for men. That's the attitude that we have to have. And Jesus, and in Matthew chapter 5, in verses 1 through 12, but we won't read all of that. Uh, in chapter 5, verses, uh, sorry, with verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you can go on and read the Beatitudes concerning all the blessings that Jesus spoke concerning the Beatitudes. The term blessed introduces the first of several Beatitudes promising blessings to those who God cares for. You see, you must come into a covenant relationship with the Lord in order for you to experience the beatitude. You must accept the gospel because what the beatitude serve as, they serve as an invitation to come into the grace that God offers freely. You know, they give away food all the time free. You see a whole bunch of people want food for free. But when he offered his invitation to come to salvation, to be saved, to be saved from what? What does salvation mean? It means to be delivered. You don't see the danger yet, but when it happens, it's going to be too late if you're not in Christ. You see, because the Lord says, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, God always takes care of the poor. He might not come when you need him, but he's going to be right on time. See, in Psalms 9 and 18, for the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectations of the poor shall not perish forever. You have expectations. You are needy. He ain't talking about your wants. He talked about your needs. My second point is serving others is a distinguishing mark of Christians in the world. You see, you like Jesus' uh, priestly prayer when he said, Father, I don't want you to take, in chapter 17 of St. John, I don't want you to take them out of the world, right? Because they're going to be in the world. Don't take them out. 
Keep them there and protect them so that they may do the work. Right. So Jesus began his sermon with the words that seem to contradict each other, but God's way of living usually contradicts the world's. The world will tell you when, when, when the scripture says in uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 4, look not on your own interest, but the interest of others. The world, mm -mm. get it on your own. I'm not going to help you with nothing, you see. If we want to live for God, you must be ready to say and do what seems strange to the world. We just moved in our new house over there in Pittsburgh. My daughters, I go to the store. My, my daughters, my, my wife call me and say, you left the bike on the side of the house. Now, mind you, we live down in an alley. I, I don't know how. how how the guy even come to see my bike. The guy came and he took my bike, my daughter's bike, rode the bike, did whatever he had to do, and brought the bike back. I said, good Lord, he brought the bike back? I said, ooh, okay. My wife, don't you, I told you, don't you leave that bike out there no more? I said, heck, I didn't know the guy was going to come down all back up in our, the area, you got to see the area. You know, you, you, you don't live there, you don't have no business there. That's one issue. And then the guy come, we got a shoe rack sitting out on the, on the uh, front door where we put our shoes. The guy come through, take somebody's shoes, walks around in them, and then brings them back. They said, and then my nephew come and he say, hey, won't you go buy you some shoes? Uh, I brought them back. I just wanted to use them. So what? Well, what are you going to do about it? We're going to go tell our daddy. So they come get me. I, I go outside. We, we all running. God starts, hey, you, you can't put your hands on it. Why don't you get a man some shoes? I said, you know what? That's a good idea. I got a whole bunch of shoes I don't wear. But at the time, if, if I would have saw the guy, I don't know what I would have did. Help me, Lord. But those, those are the things, the opportunities that we have. You know, I said, you know what, honey, this is an opportunity for us to do something for this guy. So if I see him again, the Lord haven't allowed me to see him yet. He want to make sure I'm in the right state of mind. See what I'm saying? So do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. You must be willing to give when others take. When others take. You must be willing to love when others hate. You must be willing to help where others have abused. We have a new member in our household. My nephew, my wife's sister's son. May she rest in peace. He opened up our door to him because this is what he has experienced. And we will give him a better life. So by giving up your own rights in order to serve others, you will one day receive everything God has in store for you. You see, there are those who are living on this earth right now saying, <clears throat> I don't want to wait for my piece of the pie in the sky. I want my pie now. We, we must understand that God sees all, nothing is hidden from his sight, according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. In Matthew chapter 20, verses uh, 20 through 34, I'm not going to read all of that, but the mother's request 
and Jesus heals two blind men. So in Matthew 20 and verse 25 and 26, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them shall not be so among you, but whosoever would be great among you must be your servant. Because the mama's request was that her son sit on right or the left side of the Lord in his kingdom. Jesus had to tell her, look, that's not for me. That has been left in the power of the father to decide who sits where. And when the disciples heard that, they were indignant. Everybody want to be first. Everybody want to be the best. You see, third point, by serving others, those in God's kingdom turn the world's value upside down. As we read Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4, the other disciples were upset with James and John for trying to grab the top position. All the disciples wanted to be the greatest. It's just the type of world that we live in. Everybody want to be number one. Everybody want to be the best. That's where the world is in trouble. You see, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus told him, you see this little kid? You must become like him. Dependent upon the Lord. But Jesus taught them that the greatest person in God's kingdom is the servant of all. The authority that is given is given from heaven. Not for selfish importance. Look at me. I'm wealthy. I have great authority. Don't you know I can have you locked up? Not for selfish ambition. The authority that is given from the heavens is not for selfish ambition or some great respect. Yeah, but for useful service to God and his creation, what it's for. Fourth point, serving others is real leadership. You want to talk about being a, 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 a servant, being great? Serving others is real leadership. Jesus describes leadership from a new perspective, from the perspective that you are serving and not being served. Instead of using people, we are to serve them. Jesus' mission was to serve others and give his life as a ransom for the betterment of creation. To give his life away. A real leader has a servant's heart. Servant leaders appreciate others' worth and realize that they're not above their job. See, that's the attitude that we have to have when it comes to serving. If you see something that needs to be done, young people, you see something that needs to be done, brothers and sisters, don't wait to be asked to do it. Do it. You may see an elderly lady struggling to open up a car door or crossing the street. Hopefully she won't hit you with a cane and try to help her. So you, you know, that's what we want to do. We, we, we want to, you know, we want to take the initiative and do it like a faithful servant. My final thought. Serving others is a Christian's best way to become more like Christ. More of him, less of me. That's what I need. I need more of Christ and less of self.
self. We have to get out of self. As in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Some people try to earn their way to God by keeping a set of rules. Right? Like obeying the Ten Commandments. Attending church faithfully. Or doing good deeds but all they can earn from their efforts is frustration and discouragement. Of course, God wants us to obey the laws, the commands. Of course, he wants us to attend church services faithfully, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, sake not the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some have. You see, so we are to do this because of Christ's sacrifice the way to God is already open and we can become his children simply by obeying the gospel by being baptized in the Christ for the remission of sin and striving to live a faithful life in him no longer trying to reach God by keeping rules we can come before we can come uh we can become more and more like Jesus as we live with him day by day and strive for obedience in him. So let the Holy Spirit, right, turn our eyes away uh, from our own performances and toward Jesus. He will free us to serve him out of love and gratitude. This is the new way of the spirit and not the old way of the letter as we read in Romans chapter 7 verses uh, 1 through 6 says, then I will be closed. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law. The law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married man is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you have you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been risen from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve, how do we serve? In the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Today we just have looked over how to serve, how to have a servant attitude. If you are not a Christian in this building amongst congregation of the Lord which he purchased with his own blood you have an opportunity to become a child of God by being immersed into uh, the watery tomb that your sins may be washed away I hope the congregation here has found this lesson uplifting may God be with all of us thank you